Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians, of course. And here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. This week is going to be a little different because Paul and I, not only were we not smart enough to book our summer travels at the same time, we were definitely not smart enough to not book them in back-to-back weeks. So I was out last week down in Nashville uh, attending a few things, including the Podcast Movement Conference. Paul is out this week, so we will both be back on Monday the 16th or sometime during that week. For today, though, what I wanted to do is take us back in time about five years, uh, a little over five years, five years and two months Back to one of our uh, earliest episodes and one of our first interviews to episode 68, where we had the pleasure of interviewing Jan Hammer. We've talked about this interview a few times since then, um, and of course mentioned Jan a few times since then as well. But for those of you that weren't listeners back then, I know many of you haven't gone and sought this out in the archives, so we figured we'd bring it to you. So this is simply a redux of episode 68. It's not a new episode and I think you're going to like it there. I was super nervous going into this interview. I'd known Jan for years. I used to help him uh, with his computers. I'd go to his house and fix his computers for him and everything and got to know him. And But other than peripherally here and there, Jan and I had really never talked music before. And of course, you know, bringing him onto the show, I, I you know, I was, I was nervous. That's how it was. And so I did a lot of research and I found this thing that you'll hear me play for Jan and it, it truly was a surprise to him. Paul, I don't even think Paul had heard it, but I found something buried on the internet that I figured might remind Jan of his youth and his introduction to American music. And so I took a chance and rolled the dice and played this for him completely unprompted. And, uh, and you'll hear what happened shortly here. So, um, so we'll get to it. Make sure this episode doesn't have a sponsor because it's not, you know, because uh, it's we're sort of doing a weird thing, bringing back an old episode. But I will remind you to check out uh, both of our active sponsors. Of course, Bandzoogle.com, where code GigGab gets you 15% off. And then Ultimate Ears Pro is still running their special this week, where code GigGab20 gets you 20% off there. So I don't want you to miss out on that. So I, I wanted to uh to do that for you with that here we go gig gab the working musicians podcast episode number 68 for monday june 6th 2016 Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the working musicians podcast here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Out in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you today, Mr. Paul Kent? I am doing wonderfully. I had a really nice weekend. Had a, we, had a, we had a little art and food festival at the local winery here, and they had some nice music acts, and the foods were great. And nice. So it was a non-playing weekend, but it was a, a very highly enjoyable weekend. How about you, did you gig? I had, yeah, I had some crazy gigs, and I would actually, yeah, there's, there's more stories from those that I would love to share. But for today, we actually have a guest with us. It is my extreme pleasure to introduce Mr. Jan Hammer to the show. Jan, thanks for coming. Hello there. How are you? Nice I'm, to be here. <laughs> yeah, this is good. So this is your, if, if I understand it correctly, it's your first podcast interview. Is that right? I have, yeah. Po- first podcast, anything. I've, <laughs> I haven't had any interactions with podcasts in my life yet. <laughs> well, here you go. So we're pretty relaxed here. Uh, you and I have known each other. Actually, I, I have a, we'll, we'll talk a little bit, a bit about how you and I met, but, uh, um, but yeah, you and I have known each other for a while. I used to help you with your computers when I lived down near where you live. So yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I wanted to start though. Uh, you had a very interesting introduction to music because you know, you, you didn't grow up here in the U S and so being introduced to U S music was very different for you. If I could, I would like to play you something that I'm pretty sure would be familiar to you. It's about a 20 second clip. And then I think this will walk us down the right path if I'm okay. Right. Okay. Ta 
time for jazz. Willis Conover in Washington, D.C. with the Voice of America Jazz Hour. Is that ringing any bells, Jan? Oh, my God. Are you <laughs> kidding me? I'm, I'm nine years old again. <laughs> this is, that was the first time I heard it. I was probably like nine. And it, obviously, that's Duke Ellington, Take the A Train, and Willis Conover, you know, the, the voice of God, <laughs> pretty much, for all of us in Eastern Europe. It was just the most amazing blessing that we got. And we were, you know, we were actually at home, mostly taping this. And then, you know, that was the only chance for us to hear uh, uh, any anything new and current in American jazz. It was just fantastic. Were there any jazz record shops that you could you could actually obtain records? And no way, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> we were completely embargoed. And uh, also for a long time, the Voice of America, they used, uh, uh, what is the word? Distur- you know, this, uh, they would destroy the signal by uh, interference. Ah. Really? And, yeah. And I, ultimately they, they realized that they were, it was stupid to, to try and disrupt the music. So they only disrupted the news bo- newscasts. Oh, yeah. That's right. No politics in music. That's right. Or at least yeah. not uh, none obvious. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm telling you, but Willis Conover was like uh, really just sent from heaven to us. It was just amazing, amazing person. And I was uh, lucky enough, you know, he came to Prague a couple of times and I got to meet him and, and hang out with him. And he was just, uh, you know, as wonderful as he sounds on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had a, a very calming voice. I mean, you can hear the, the, the decades of cigarette smoking in his voice, but that that sort of smoothed them out and gave him a calm sound. Yeah. Yeah. No, he was he was just a wonderful, wonderful presence. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you did bring me back. I mean, I uh, I uh, most of the things that really in early influences on my music, uh, musical upbringing, uh, you know, other than classical studies, which, you know, obviously everybody has to go through was really Voice of America for quite a few years. And then some people were able to send us records that actually arrived not broken. You know, (laughs) you wouldn't believe sometimes you get in like a, you know, a lovely record that you're expecting and it's cracked in half. So I'm sorry. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if it was on, on purpose, you know, these people just like were, you know, just ugly Ugly <laughs> commies. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. So you were, were, you were. I mean, you started playing piano at a at a, at a very young age, right? Uh, well, roughly around four. You okay. know, you know, just picking things out, and then from six onwards, I started having proper piano lessons. Okay. So, but but learning these kinds of tunes, you had to learn these by ear, right? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, it was. I always saw my father, who was this sort of a natural musician that. He was originally a bass player. He also played vibraphone, but he could also sit at the piano and just like effortlessly play and pick out tunes. And I, I just saw it and I said, this is something I want to do, you know? So really it was mainly, you know, watching my father at the at the piano, which was not even his main instrument. And, uh, you know, just figuring out how that I have to do this somehow for myself too. And that's, that's, uh, that's how you start. You, you know, you work as an apprentice in a sense where, you pick out whatever you can and then make it work for you. Did your father come from a musical family as well? Not exactly. My the, That whole family was mostly doctors. <laughs> and I was, you know, I was supposed to be a doctor too, except I became the black sheep. <laughs> <laughs> thank God for that. Yeah, yeah. That's that. We, yes. Thank goodness. <laughs> uh, you, you know, you're and, and I think based on the conversations we've had, I mean, I, I, I think that sort of describes your career. You just kind of kept doing, you've done so many different things. How much intention was there in, in, in that? I mean, you came to the, by the time you came to the U S then you started playing with Sarah Vaughn and, and it, things sort of grew from there. But what, what was, I've heard you say it, it was all a happy accident, but I don't believe it. it. I mean, you had to have some idea that you wanted to push on this, right? Well, I, it was it was a combination, obviously, of sure. uh, being, uh, where where I was, where the uh, world culture, world music was at, and being exposed to things that excited me. And once I got excited about something, I said, "Well, I'm, I can do that too." So that's how I followed from you know classical studies to jazz piano. And then eventually hearing, you know, Beatles and Hendrix, you say, oh, my God, this is pretty awesome. And uh, so it wasn't just that I was going to be stuck doing one thing. 
And also same same reason looking through piano on, onwards to electric piano and then the synthesizer, which basically gave me my own voice ultimately, which, you know, I could do the most uh, be most noticed and do, you know, do some really valid things with 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 the voice of synthesizer. Yeah. So I'm I'm cu- I'm curious about that because obviously you're very well known for everything that you've done with the synthesizer, especially in terms of creating your own sound. Uh, I mean, there's sounds that people use all over the place today that really started with you and and a couple of others. To be fair, uh, was was that out of um, just artistic expression, or was there some necessity involved in that, uh, in terms of getting your sound, you know, to be heard through the mix, if you will? Well, obviously, acoustic piano will only get you that far. Right. Once, once you start dealing with uh, rock, rock influenced jazz, jazz rock, or whatever hybrid you want to call, uh, you have to go to electric piano to at least, you know, be able to stand up sonic wise to guitars and ba- electric basses and all that stuff, yeah. and also, you know, with with all that, all the amplification, you know, you just had to do that. But I think in my case, there was an extra thing where I was uh, very much influenced by Eastern European uh, music in a sense where there's, you know, there's the melodies don't go, they're not steady, uh, sort of fixed notes or fixed pitches, as I say, like on a piano. There is all kinds of, you know, vocal things and violin and uh and so on and so on, where where the melodies bend, and uh, and to me the expression, I, I, it was necessary for me to find an instrument where I could actually bend notes and bend pitch to to express the things that I was hearing, you know, and that the things that I wanted to play. So I think it, it was, you know, that that's how I ended up totally gravitating towards. Uh, I even used speaking of, you know, if you want to use a geek something really geeky there was a thing called uh uh bold was it speech shifter of some kind okay it was i think moog made it and it was this little box that i was using on on the vendor roads and it would ab- actually enable me to try and bend the notes of an electric piano just a little bit but there was uh you know it was just a, sure, you know, it didn't last very long because it wasn't very efficient. Sure. And once, I, once I got my hands on a mini Moog, it was it was all over. Right. So yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, the the, the mini Moogs, you were one of the first. Um, and what was that like working? I mean, you were on the road with with Mahavishnu using this instrument that basically was like an alpha test of a piece of technology, right? I mean, this was not a proven thing that you bought off the shelf. You had something that no one else had. No, actually, what I I actually bought a, a commercial release of a Minimoog at Manny's oh, in New York in New York City. Oh no, kidding! Oh, okay. Yeah, no, at that point uh, it was not. You know, there were modular synths, which were you know these gigantic things that uh, you had to use patch chords and stuff. And uh, when people, you know, like Keith Emerson, were used them, it was mostly you know just for show. You know, there was like you could do you know very little with it. But once the Minimoog was put together into a compact uh, box where everything was uh, already pre-patched and all you had to do was play with filters and oscillators, they were already pre-patched in a most uh, efficient way. It was, you know, just a piece of cake to actually go through. Well, it wasn't a piece of cake. <laughs> I did. I remember, you know, buying the thing, Minimoog, taking it home to my apartment in the city. And ju- I spent probably two or three weeks just, you know, sitting there and figuring out, you know, what am I going to do with this? And once I started playing with the pitch wheel, I realized that this was going to work for me. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you opened the door to that pitch wheel thing and, and you've used it well. And some people have used it well and others, not so much. <laughs> but, uh, not so much. Exactly. I, I, I got to a point where I said, I think they should hand out, li- they should give out licenses to play a mo- <laughs> or, or, or use a pitch bent wheel because it's, you know, it's criminal what some people do with it. Fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I do want to ask a question. You mentioned uh, Keith Emerson, and uh, you know we've been talking a lot about the fallen stars that have that have. Uh, oh right, uh, yeah, right. Jesus. Did you yeah. ever have a chance to play with Keith? Oh, many times. I mean, we we played a uh, we played. Uh, speaking of a Mahavishnu Orchestra, we opened for them for El Emerson Lake and Palmer 
in uh, Denver and San Francisco, like early on in, in our, and uh, it was, it was, they weren't very happy with us opening because we would sort of, <laughs> we would freak people out and it, they didn't get the reaction that they like to get. Wow. So to put, to put it mildly, but you know, over time, you know, all time heals all wounds and then we met, you know, at some festivals and all that and hung out. And, you know, I remember we were at the Puerto Rico festival. What was it called? Uh, Marisol Festival, which was sort of like another attempt at a Woodstock on, on the island of Puerto Rico. And there was about, I don't know, 200, 300,000 people in a noonday sun we played there. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and uh, so I remember playing ping pong with Keith at the hotel. And then, and to jump completely out of, you know, out of sequence, uh, I remember my last gig that uh, I actually played because I sort of, you know, faded away from really, I wasn't interested in, you know, keeping a band together and going out on the road. But this was a great occasion, which was called the Moog Fest in the, it was, it took place at BB Kings in New York City. And they were, you know, a few of us, you know, played the, played the concert and Keith was one of the people and uh, Jordan Rudis. And uh, it was it was really a wonderful gig. And there was I played uh, I got this group called Mahavishnu Project. I don't know if you heard of them. They 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 are like a Mahavishnu tribute band. They're really good musicians. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so they they backed me up. So it was really easy to I could just sort of fit right in. I didn't have to spend you know weeks rehearsing a new new band and stuff. But that's about it as far as playing live. But that was the last time I saw Keith. Uh, Any and reflections was, on on uh, Keith's contribution to keyboard music and his, you know his virtuosity? Oh, I mean, what can I say? I, uh, he was, it, it was, it, it, we didn't have very much in common other than oh, obviously the, you know, the synthesizer and, uh, but the way he used it was a little bit different than, you know, I, I was more of a, uh, jazz influenced improvising voice. You know, he was more of an, uh, for him, it was more of an orchestrator mm. tool. And, uh, but he was just an amazing musician. I mean, I, I have to, my head goes off. And I was worried. I remember he was complaining about his uh, wrist a uh, few years before then. You know, we were in Los Angeles and we were sitting somewhere in a bar and we were saying that he's, he's, he has to have some sort of an operation on a, but he's, it sounded like a carpal tunnel then. Mm. Yeah. So I don't know how, how much worse it got or how much more involved, but it was kind of scary because I, so far, you know, I haven't, I've have been lucky. I mean, you know, as far as any kind of uh, problems with, with, uh, uh, arthritis or stuff like that. I never had any of that problem. So I, I was at that gig, the uh, mini Moog or the Moog festival that, that oh, right. the yeah. last one you played. Right. Yeah. Elliot, Elliot Sears, your manager who was uh, helpful in coordinating all of this. And uh, actually the one who introduced us years and years and years ago right. um, had gotten me a seat. And I actually sat next to Rick Laird that night. Oh, right. Uh, right. He and his wife were there and it was really kind of interesting hearing you know, you guys would start a song. And of course, these were songs that you had played together, you know, many, many decades before. And yeah. he was like a little kid. He would, he'd, he'd, he'd like nudge me. Dave, I used to count this one in 11 and a half, four. That's how I got <laughs> through this tune. It was, it was really, a, it was a fun night. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, you mentioned that, uh, you know, you, you played and, and you would freak people out with the Mahavishnu Orchestra, but that was sort of your M.O., right? You would open for anybody you could. At least this is well, the story were, I heard. Yeah. yeah. Those were our initials, too. So, uh, M.O. <laughs> yeah, no, I got it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, no, I'm, our very first gig, I remember we played at the uh, uh, Village of Go Go on Bleecker Street. There's like a club downstairs. Uh, the very legendary, uh, you know, jazz and rock club. And I remember the first night after, you know, we rehearsed for the whole summer, we, you know, organized our music and we were starting to make it, make the album. But at, the, at night we would go to this place and play live. And I remember after first tune, people didn't clap. <laughs> there was like a stunned silence for quite a while. And then they started clapping, but it was a most unusual reaction I've ever heard. It, you know, usually people just say, oh, they're even out of politeness. They just start clapping, but they were like shocked. <laughs> but that worked so well that for fun. you, right? Because you made an impression on, on crowds while you were opening up and then you could go back and tour and, and, and actually draw people to gigs and that worked out. Yeah, it definitely worked out for the better. <laughs> yeah, it was it was an amazing, amazing experience. So it, it was it was an amazing experience and a short lived experience. I've heard you call 
Mahavishnu a pressure cooker. And it, and and it's not surprising listening to just one song. I mean, it, that reaction you got from those people probably sums it all up. Wow. Y you know, well, that, was, I, that was the first time they heard anything like that. It, yeah. was, it was really music that was not done before. So I think that that's what made the difference. Yeah. I, it, but it, it was also it seems to me as an outsider, it seems to me like it was a lot of personalities all speaking at once, but in a in a beautiful way. But I I I. I always, I mean, I, I heard about the band afterwards. I'm, I'm, I wasn't old enough to experience it in its, you yeah. know, in its prime. Uh, but, uh, but it wasn't surprising to me that that band didn't last. Uh, it just seemed like all the ideas got out and then it was time to move on. Is that, is that a, f a fair way to say it? Yeah, it was, it was just really, really intense. And uh, I, it's, it's hard to describe, uh, but it, it, we were not prepared for how big it became. And uh, we, we, we still, it was all treated more or less as a jazz group arrangement where, you know, we sort of contributed much more than we were credited for. I'm talking about uh, the four others other than John McLaughlin. Sure, sure. And th that, that was like the, or eventually that became a big source of contention where, mm. you know, it just, uh, it just wouldn't work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, yeah, uh, not, not surprising. What, what was... I don't know if I should ask what was easier or what was more fun uh, with Mahavishnu. Was it the road or the studio? I would say road was easier because in the studio, we were, we, you don't know what kind of an obstacle you're going to hit next. You know what I mean? There is always like a, in the studio when you're creating new stuff and trying to do the best recording and uh, arrangements and all that, you, there's always some hurdles that you didn't expect. Whereas once you are, on the road and it's a well, you incredibly well oiled machine. It's like a, you know, a incredible Ferrari that's like running on 12 cylinders. Mm. And, uh, that sort of sustained itself to the point where it was easier to, to handle rather than let's say going back into the studio. Yeah. 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 The start of it, the, the start time of a gig was the start time of a gig. You had to go play even if, even <laughs> no matter yeah. what. Yeah. Um, I know that you, you've, and you've told me this, and you, I think you've said this to other people too, that you really don't like the, the touring aspect of touring, driving all around and living on, living on a bus and all of that. But your last gig was 11 years ago, uh, almost to the day, I think, if, uh, if memory serves me, but, uh, I would swear, I would swear it was 10 years ago to 2006, I think it was Right after we moved to New Hampshire, because I had to take the train down from here and we moved here in 05, I think, but maybe it was 06. Maybe it was a no, year later. Was, maybe. Yeah. Maybe it was a year later. Yeah. Yeah. That's possible. Yeah. yeah. No, it was 06. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Um, <laughs> but so you haven't played a gig in 10 years. Do you miss playing live? I mean, if, if the right circumstance came up, uh, is it something you would do? Obviously, I would, you know, I would enjoy it, you know, especially if it wasn't like any a sort of an extended thing. Sure. But just by definition, in order to be able to do that, you have to go through the whole process of, again, putting together a group of people, rehearsing. Uh, you know, I, 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 on top of it, my biggest uh, quandary is what would I play? I, I, I mean, I could always play, you know, same things that I used to play, like with with my group or with Mahavishnu. But I, I also did lots of other things, like you know, all, the, my whole sort of instrumental uh, EDM or e electronic music, pop, yeah, you know, and all those things I like very much too. And uh, people, you know, do not know there's people who like me for one thing, then there are people who like me for the other. And there is about three or four different genres I could cover. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't know what to do first. And you cannot, you know, I don't see how I could do it. So basically I just chicken out and don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine that the largest cross section is going to be people who would like whatever you feel like emoting at the time. I mean, I think they just want to know what, where your creative head is at any one time. And if that was the case right now, would it be, would it be a cross section of everything? Are you spending more time? With digital music, are you spending? Are you back on a on a on a grand piano and, and just playing piano music? A what little would, what, bit. What but yeah, no, mostly mostly I'm definitely in the studio and uh, a lot, lots of beautiful you know virtual instruments that are happening that are just so amazing uh, you know like expanding the palette of sounds that that we didn't have you know thirty years ago. So yeah. I'm uh, very much into that, and it's it's some sort of a hybrid, obviously, but. Uh, 
you know, there's there's a large group of people who really like the things that I did for for the TV show for for Miami Vice, and there is all kinds of music that sort of grew out of that that I'm still uh, very much into. So even though you know it's probably more more spicy and more energetic than you know the the score scoring music, you know the back, background scoring music. Yes. So, uh, but still, you know, that's probably where if I were to describe. To try to describe where where my head is at or what I'm working on when I you know when I do something it would be more mostly like that that grew out of the you know the the few years that I that I worked on this on the show and that that really became my signature sound and I would say that you know the Miami Vice stuff is is so interesting I mean there, there certainly is iconic music for television that's been written over times but if there has ever been a, you know just a sound that represented a feeling that introduced a show you know that so accurately represented like i said you know there's there's many iconic songs through the history of television that people might think of but you can feel the sound of that Miami Vice music and see that boat cruising across the ocean and you just yeah. you're just so connected how did that all come about I, i'd read somewhere that you actually had had that music before you actually got approached to do the the work for that yeah no, i had it uh, i you know i was carrying sketches around of different things and this was something that i was very interested in, which was the you know the sequencer the programmed uh, rhythm on a by that synth the synth sort of bass like sound plays that i got the accompaniment for the for the theme that gives it the whole pulse i was experimenting with these overlapping patterns that you know it was i, I don't know how to describe it but that, that's what that, that was it was just uh using a fairlight csc a computer musical instrument and uh, sampling different, you know, my mini Moog and memory Moog, and then using it to compose an overlapping sequence of rhythms. And they, that's how the thing came about. And I, I had a sketch that I worked out on that. And that was something that I played for when I first met Michael Mann. And in, in, uh, when they were still, you know, basically casting the show wasn't even, you know, they didn't even get to film it. And he wanted to hear something that didn't sound like any music on television. And I said, well, check this out. And I played them, you know, I had a, a cassette at the time, believe it or not. <laughs> this was 1984. <laughs> and and, uh, and he, he liked it very much. And he, even though he wanted me to do the show and I ended up uh, writing three or four other attempts at a theme theme, we ended up in the end going back to the original thing that I played. him, <laughs> And that's how it usually is. You know, the first instinct really was right. Absolutely. Well, it is fantastic music and it, it, it will live forever. You know, in reruns of that show, the people will be reminded just how remarkable the music could set the scene for the experience people can have with the show. So I, I, you've done so many great things, but it's interesting that that probably your most commercial pop work uh, is something that I just find, you know, really gripping and, um, and I think will live forever. Well, I mean, it was also, you know, it went to number one on, on, yeah. on billboards 100 which is astonishing yeah for for a tv show for for yeah for instrumental also <laughs> an instrumental theme to a tv show i remember i don't know if there's a it's a funny story but it was really surprising uh i was watching the you know we were all watching the charts and i remember stevie wonder was uh in number one and we were like in, i don't know three or three or four and moving up slowly and then i get a phone call here at my house and the voice on the other hand says, hi, this is Henry Mancini. Huh? And I said, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was Henry Mancini and he called to congratulate me. He just found out we were going to number one this week, <laughs> wow. that week. And he, he, you know, Peter Gunn was the last TV theme that uh, made it to number one, like, you know, 15 or I don't know how many, 20 years prior. Been, yeah, 20. Yeah. And so it, he just called me out of the blue, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that was wonderful. Well, I would imagine from the unique things that you're doing that your phone rang um, out of the blue often. Is there a story about how the first interaction with Jeff Beck took place? Well, what that wasn't a phone. That was, uh, again, we were on a tour in Europe with the uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra. And we ended up in Zurich in, uh, I guess it was June because it was Jeff's birthday. And... Uh, we were playing in Zurich in the big concert hall and Jeff played the next day in the same place. And we ended up staying in the same hotel and, and Jeff had a big blowout party for his birthday. So we ended up, that's how I met him first time. And uh, this was like a 73, 
Right. And we ended up, you know, talking about music we like and how, what, how you respond to groove and uh, feel. And, and it was just amazing but that we realized how much we like same things. You know, we were just talking the same language. And uh, eventually, he, you know, he ended up, I remember the, the next time I saw him, he came, he actually showed up at my house, which is not exactly, you know, it's sort of out of the way if you want to, you have to go like an, over an hour north of New York City to get here. And he showed up here with a, a rough mix of his new record, the Blow by Blow record. And he was just, he just wanted to play it for me and talk about it. And then we said, well, after this, we got to do something, you know, together. So then we ended up working on the, on the next album, which was uh, called Wired. Yeah. And so, I mean, this was, this was more like personal, all personal contact. It was not, not much phone <laughs> interaction at all. Got it. Um, what did you think when you heard Blow by Blow uh, for the first time? Oh, it was, I mean, it was beautiful. I mean, it was, uh, everything about it was just, uh, it was, again, Jeff is very rare musician who, uh, you would think that guitar can only do something, right? I mean, that it's been done. I mean, Jimmy, I mean, just took it, you know, to, to Mars and back. And uh, Jeff is changing every few years. He figures out something, how to mangle the guitar, how to do something with the, with the whammy bar, where he actually plays all melodies with it. Uh, and on and on. I mean, it's just an amazing metamorphosis every three or four years. And I'm just so impressed you know, how, how he manages to reinvent guitar. <laughs> but he, use, he uses the whammy bar like you use the pitch wheel. And, and I think the same rules should apply that you need a license for either one of absolutely. them. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. abs- absolutely. Yes. Abs- <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Now you, you did a lot with, with Jeff, but um, a lot of people might not know that in addition to playing keys, you're actually a, a great drummer. And, uh, and at least on, on there and back, you played drums on, on the opening track for, for that. If I, if I, if memory serves, right. And on wire too. Oh, you played <laughs> drums on wire too. Okay. Well, see, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've been, I've been a drummer probably as long, maybe, you know, one year off, but I put together some homemade drums at, at, at our home in Prague and I kept banging, you know, for years and years playing along with uh, mainly with, you know, jazz records, playing along with Elvin Jones and <laughs> things like that. And I was totally, I would, I would have to say that at that time I found drums to be more fun than piano because piano was like, to me, that was work. Hmm. And drums were like really incredible hobby. But I just, you know, happened to develop and got really good at it after a while, but yeah. it was not, it was never work. It was something, oh, let's do this. This is fun. And yeah. piano, was, piano was a little bit of a drudgery, especially the classical end of it. So now, now, you, we, now you make me even more upset because as a drummer, I remember I was playing with some guys and we were playing Star Cycle and I couldn't figure out how you played the groove. And I happened to be at your house working on something, uh, the computer for your studio. And I oh, remember yeah. asking you, how did you play that? And you're like, oh, I, I don't remember. And you just kind of waved your hands in the air. And it was I actually understood what you were telling me, but hearing you say that, oh, it's just a, a, a hobby that makes me, it makes me need to go back to the woodshed as a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, yeah, that was, that was a nice groove. I mean, I, I, I still, re- I sort of remember, I don't know if, if I would, would have dismissed it because I'm sort of very proud of it because it was kind of a complex, but it still, you know, really propelled the tune forward. So. And you, you played it open handed, I think is what you showed me, right? That, that you didn't cross your arms to play that groove on the hi hat. I think you were playing it open handed, or at least that's, that's, that's how you showed me that day. And it, it, it helped me get it certainly a lot easier so yeah i think so yeah that's yeah. true yeah. yeah yeah and now hey. you played drums on an entire santana album too uh, again no i don't think it was there was i think there was about half of the album oh, okay the, i thought okay all right i thought it was the whole thing yeah. there was the one with mclaughlin and santana yeah yeah there were there were billy played on one tune and uh, i played with mike shreve and i played on a couple of tunes it, I, and that's you know awesome. it was it was it was just a big crowd of people playing. There was, it was wonderful. It was just an experience. <laughs> That's awesome. Jan, I wanted to ask a question. You know, when you talk about your, your keyboard playing as work and uh, I want to ask you a question about virtuosity. I want to understand what your work ethic was and how much of, how much of your skills are, are from the divine and how much of your skills are from just a lot of time that you put in. And do you have any thoughts about, you know, you've played with such amazing musicians around the world are great musicians born or are great musicians earned? 
That is a sixty-four million dollar question. Obviously, uh, I, I I I would say I would guess that it's probably half and half. You have to provide uh, you know the, the the underpinnings of technique, but it, all the technique in the world again, it's not going to get you across if you don't you know have the juju happening. Mm. So. I think it's probably half and half for the most uh, successful people. There are some people who, you know, probably have uh, even more of the divine intervention and they don't even know how they got there, but good for them. But, you know, there was obviously work involved uh, in my case, but I would call, I would probably call it about a half. And uh, at what point in your life were you working the hardest at keyboards? I mean, when you made this decision not to be a doctor and you knew, was that a, a turning point for you in terms of your of your practice regimens or, or when you were putting your first bands together and you were going to be playing with these other cats and you were going to be pushed all the time. When were you working the hardest? As far as, uh, Oh yeah. I would say right before I came to the United States. And then once I got here, when I was at Berkeley school, I remember actually using, uh, exercise rooms, which was something that I've never done before. And I would just go and lock myself in and actually woodshed. <laughs> And uh, because that was the time where I was very much into modern, modern jazz and, uh, and, and eventually that evolved, you know, evolved into Mahavishnu as well. So that's probably when I was the most actively uh, pursuing the actual piano technique. Interesting. Any essence, you know, quantify it. Was it, was it two hours a day, six hours a day? Oh, never, never six. No, it was probably maximum like two, two hours. That, that, that would be like the most, I know people always say like, Oh, this guy sits there. It's like eight hours a day. And that's <laughs> why, yeah. I mean, it, I think classical music requires that. Uh, I was more of a, from the world where I, you know, Im- improvising where I could actually do anything I wanted. And that was, that was the secret because I didn't have to follow a, a <laughs> set set of, you know, sheet papers. <laughs> Very cool. How about, um, a little bit more about these guitarists that you play with. You've played with some of the most amazing guitarists in the world. We talked about Jeff. Um, we haven't talked about Al Demiola or Neil Sean. Um, what turns you on about playing with guitarists? Is it tone? Is it is it is it groove? What do you look for when you're when you're working with guitarists? Well, I like music to be really hot, and the thing you cannot have a hot band without a guitar. It's, it's I agree. Yeah. you know what I mean? You can, you can have a hot band without keyboard. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, I was always, you know, learning from what makes guitar so hot and exciting. And it was, you know, it's a, it's a combination of things. A lot of it has to do with, with the actual rude sound where you, when you just go and it's like in your face. Mm. So, uh, that's why I sort of pursued that over the years. And, uh, it was not exactly to emulate guitar per se, but it was just using that real exciting uh, spirit that's in there. And then, you know, if you listen to where I play, obviously those notes could not be played on a guitar because notes on the guitar follow a different uh, regimen. <laughs> and then, it, you know what I'm saying? If you, if you play it from a keyboard, it's a, it, you know, I mean, guitar players know when, you know, when they hear me, they know that it's not a guitar. <laughs> sure. Yes, absolutely. But, yeah, but the sound can, sometimes... <laughs> Yes. I was going to say, you make the keyboard sound like a guitar sometimes. Definitely. Sound, yes. But the actual music Mm. coming out with that sound is more more keyboardy than people realize. And that's what makes it stand out. Yeah. So you've played with (laughs) you've played with a lot of guitar players. If is there anybody that you you didn't get to play with that you would have loved to play with? Of course, Jimmy. (laughs) Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I met him. I met him a couple of times. We were recording uh, with uh, in uh, Electric Lady in his studio in uh, in the village, and he would drop by and listen to us. And he was uh, very much, you know, into it. It, it was we were just doing, you know, experimental sort of early, early uh, jam, jazz rock kind of thing. And he really liked it. And he said, like, you know, we should definitely, you know, hook up and do this and get together. And uh, next thing I know, he's, you know. Dead in London. Yeah. I think minds are exploding all over the world right now at the thought of Jimi Hendrix sitting in with Jan Hammer. That would just, <laughs> that would have been, yeah, it would have been ultimate, you know, for, for came, aficionados. We came close. <laughs> oh, man. But at least, I mean, I'm glad that I got to meet him because, you know, the guy yeah. is probably a very essential, essential, other than Miles Davis, 
uh, Jimi Hendrix is probably the most you know influential musician that that were that got my head worked over. So you've named two of my three, and the third would be Jocko. Did you ever work or or work work or meet Jocko? Work with or meet Jocko? Yeah, I actually believe it or not, uh, my friend, uh, you know, great pianist Paul Blay. I don't know if you know him. Yeah, avant garde. Uh, he, he was he had a gig in Cafe Wa in in village. Yep. And he, his drummer couldn't make it. So guess what? Ah. I, I, <laughs> I said, I'll play. <laughs> so I went down there, set up my drums, and he, he, I had no idea who, was gonna, who else was going to play. And this was like, again, probably 1973 and uh, 72 maybe. And uh, he said, I, there's this new bass player, you know. Oh, <laughs> oh man. And it was Chaco. <laughs> and then also he says, there's this, I, I, there's a great guitar player. It's Pat Metheny. <laughs> Holy and, crap. So, and there is no recording of this, which pisses me off. But yeah. it, it was it was an amazing night. You know, we just played, you know, Paul's tunes and and uh, but it was, you know, Jacko and Pat Metheny. So that's that's how I met Jacko. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> man. Very yeah. cool. Gosh. That's being in the right place at the right time. That's good. Well, yeah. Village Village was the place in the yeah. universe. That was the center. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Very, very cool. So what's, um, what's next for you? Are you working on anything now? What's, what's going on? Well, I'm actually work, putting together a collection of music, but you, can, you cannot call it CD or an album anymore, but it'll be, you know, I still think that it sort of belongs together uh, by, uh, you know, it's birth right. <laughs> Cause it's coming out of me. So uh, I, it, it'll be, you know, some sort of a collection and I, you know, I've been working on it for quite a while and, uh, I, you know, I've been, I I have sketches that I didn't finish that I actually, I, I don't know, you mentioned that I actually kept, uh, they were all in studio, studio vision, opcode studio vision files. Yeah. And, and, and to go dig, dig through it, I actually have a old G4, the gray plastic Mac and running nine to <laughs> no kidding. So you've still got that stuff alive. I that's got it great. Sitting, yeah. It's, it's sitting in a corner, but I can fire it up and it just, you know, yeah. that's how I, it, all those things, because those files are specific to studio vision. You can, if you make them into MIDI files, it's, it, you know, again, it's lots of work and uh, I don't, I, I don't have, you know, appetite for that kind of work. So sure. actually I go through it, organize it. And then at the very end, I port it over to pro tools via MIDI files. Okay, so here's the thing. I, I'm always pleased as punch when I look at my phone and it's you calling, but I do not want to get the call from you someday that <laughs> that machine doesn't work and you don't have a backup. So please, please tell me that you've got a backup of all that data. Well, no, the data is backed up on 17, 17 different drives. Yeah. Great. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. I can and help also, you recover you know, it. It just needs to be yeah. somewhere. Yeah, exactly. And I also have multiple versions of Studio Visions, you know, installed. Yeah things so okay I'm, good hey. <laughs> now speaking of of computers and I, I i i've never asked you about this but uh when i was at your manager elliot sears's office one time i don't know 15 years ago he points to a mac 2 on the floor and he says oh that's the computer that holds all the tracks that uh jan recorded for miami vice I, is that the case i mean did you did you do all that on a mac 2 and is it still sitting on elliot's floor <laughs> Well, I don't know if he if he's uh, I, I, I'm, he may be a little bit confused about it. Because okay, there was when I did Miami Vice, there was no Mac Two yet. That, okay, that that makes sense. Yeah, you know what I mean. It was it yeah. was Mac Plus, and I actually for some parts of it, I actually used the PC. You know, God forgive me. Uh, Happens to uh, the best of us, Jan. And uh, because there was there was no real honest to goodness uh, sequencer yet. That I knew of, uh, you know, I mean, eventually I, I worked my way towards it, but, and also the sequencing, a lot of it was done on an internal sequencer in a memory mode, which, uh, you know, was just an amazing instrument. And then fi fi of course, a Fairlight, you know, page, right. page, uh, what was it? Page R in Fairlight system is a sequencer, very, very rudimentary one, but it, uh, that's how I created the theme. <laughs> awesome. So, Hey, it worked. <laughs> yeah, no, that, well, that's the thing is, yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, the, no, the, the limitation Mac, Mac came in just a little bit later. Right. Right. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Paul, you got any more questions for Jan? I, I, I have a million more questions. Yeah. For Jan. I wish this could go on forever. <laughs> just one last thing. Cause I'm a big Neil Sean fan. Uh, any um, reflections on your playing with Neil? Oh my God. We just, I just remastered uh, the two albums that we did in, uh, in 83, 82, 83. 
uh, that for uh, we we got them for you know for online for download and streaming and and now we are actually gonna put special edition you know on a CD even so you know it's still there for people you know people of a certain age who love that music they probably still like CDs so and uh, I'm just so proud of it it was just such a wonderful wonderful project and we 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 added a couple of bonus tracks we just re- recorded a. Uh, thing and I also played on his last couple of last two albums that he just did his solo album so I'm you know I'm still in touch with him and he is you know just another I, I don't know if, if I know a harder guitar player than Neil I mean and listening to him and it's and it's not just his uh, soloing I was just blown away by all his rhythm playing on the on the record that we did the rhythm guitar it's like a master class this is how you do it you know uh, I mean I just love the guy fantastic this has been incredible, Jan. Thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, okay. it was my pleasure. Yeah, man, it's been great, folks. If uh, if you have anything to to send us, you can find us on Facebook, Gig Gab Podcast. You can email us feedback at Gig Gab Podcast. And uh, yeah, Jan, thank you so much for doing this. This it, it's been great to chat. You and I usually yeah. usually when we chat, it's about computers. So uh, so it was yeah, nice to was fun. much yeah. more fun. <laughs> yeah, much more fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll see you next week, folks. All right. Hey, John.